If you believe in evolution, you know we descended from lower life forms. That doesn't make us lowlifes, does it? Some people disapprove of Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species. It may imply that we're less than divine and more like this. Others admire Darwin's elegant theory. And you? I'm Andre Brower at the Library of Congress. Trace the origin of species next on TLC's Great Books Festival. as history. In the 17th century, an Irish archbishop named James Usher calculated the date of creation by studying genealogies recorded in the Bible. God made the world in 4004 BC, he said. Six thousand years later, naturalists of 19th century England had some questions for God. Why did God make so many species? Why should there be thousands of kinds of birds? And why, for heaven's sakes, should there be over a million different kinds of bugs? Why did God bury the bones of unknown animals in ancient rocks? And why did high hills look like they were once at the bottom of the sea? It would take far more than 6,000 years to move a seashell to the top of a mountain. It took a born naturalist and trained observer, an Englishman named Charles Darwin, to hold the world up to the microscope of his mind and see what everyone else had seen, but in a way no one else ever had. It is interesting to contemplate a tangled bank clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other and dependent upon each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. What Darwin gave us is an explanation, I go further, the explanation, for why we exist. The publication of The Origin of Species by Darwin in 1859 ushered in the greatest intellectual revolution since the proclamation of Christianity 2,000 years earlier. Darwin visualized the progress of evolution as being like a tree, a tree of life from the solid trunk of a very limited number of primitive organisms, over time, sprouted the stout branches of fish and reptiles and plants and insects and mammals. They, in turn, 
branched out again and again, until finally there were roses and radishes, pigeons and peacocks, monkeys, apes, and humans. Darwin's explanation was based on his theory of natural selection. In the random shuffle of heredity, each new individual is born slightly different from others. Occasionally, an individual will be born who is stronger, faster, or better able to cope with the changing world. That individual will thrive and pass on the advantage to its offspring. Generation upon generation, small changes accumulate until the new organism no longer breeds with what its ancestors had been. A new species has evolved. Non-random survival over countless generations leads to a gradual evolutionary change from small beginnings on our planet like bacteria over a sufficiently large number of these non-randomly selected generations you end up with things like us mammals birds highly complicated beautifully designed creatures there's not a shred of evidence that will stand the test of time that denies the biblical account of creation that when god created adam and then took eve out of the side of adam they were as complete as we are now that there was no evolution no change Darwin's theories moved man from his long-held position at the center of creation, causing a clash that carries over even to today. Nearly half of all Americans have said they prefer the biblical account of creation. It's like to me saying that this watch, with all of its intricate parts, uh, Somebody somewhere just threw a lot of metal up in the air one day and it came down a watch that tells me exactly what time it is. Uh, it's even more ridiculous than that because man is by far a more marvelous creation than this wristwatch. The argument goes that if there is a watch, there must have been a watchmaker. So surely the far more intricate world of living things must imply a designer. What Darwin was saying is that the struggle for survival alone, given immense spans of time, can produce the rich and varied world we see today. Darwin knew his book would get him into trouble with those who take the Bible literally. So in hundreds of pages of examples of evolution, man gets only a single sentence on the last page. In the future, I see open fields for far more important researches. Much light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. I think people want to believe they're quite special, that, you know, somebody, God, put them there specially as a quite unique kind of creature and minds about them differently from what he minds about other creatures. And of course, that's very much not part of Darwin's view. I mean, we're just another species out of many. Nothing special about us at all. It seems to be true that real opposition to Darwin developed when people recognized the full implication that we are closely related to apes. It, this is hard for us to believe today because we're so obviously related to apes. I mean, they're so immensely similar to us. But it, it nevertheless appears to be historically true that that was what gave people the most trouble. And there's that wonderful saying which comes down to us from the Victorian period of a, of a bishop's wife who, when she heard about the idea of evolution, is supposed to have said, uh, let us uh, pray that it's not true, but if it is, let us hope that it will not become widely known. And uh, I, I think that this is a reflection of a real discomfort that many people have always had with the notion that we are part of a planetary process of evolutionary change. 43 years after his death, Darwin was in the headlines all across America. They called it the Scopes Monkey Trial. Dateline, Dayton, Tennessee, July 11th, 1925. In a moment, the story. Young John Scopes was charged with teaching evolution in his public school classroom. Perennial presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan rose from his sickbed to rally the prosecution. Defending Scopes was the equally famous Clarence Darrow. On the day of the trial, a full house of avid spectators from all over the nation filed in to hear the debate. 
The issue was no longer the innocence or guilt of Scopes, but rather the final death struggle between two basic human philosophies, fundamentalism versus modernism. In the end, Scopes was found guilty and fined $100. The verdict was overturned on a technicality, but the law stayed on the books in Tennessee until 1967. The Scopes trial was just as farcical as, as some of the trials today in which uh, teachers are ordered not to teach the creation model. A teacher should be allowed to teach any and all perspectives of truth. It's been our experience that when we do that openly and fairly, creation wins hands down. That people would prefer miracles to a simple natural law puzzles some researchers and angers others. That 47% of the American population doesn't believe in evolution is a very frightening statistic. It's frightening from uh, an educator's point of view because it denies the basic unifying principle of biology, which is, as, uh, to paraphrase it, uh, nothing in, uh, in biology makes sense except from an evolutionary perspective. Darwinism has more than its fair share of skepticism, and it's rather hard to see why that should be. Part of the problem is that it's simply, people are simply ignorant of it. I mean, it's an astonishing thing, but it's true about our educational system, that we, we teach children just about everything except this really certain fact that we now know, which is, which is why we exist. I believe that there is no other explanation for the kind of elegant, apparently designed complexity that we call life, that indeed defines life. Darwin was careful to suggest that a creator might have started the whole process, breathing life into the first organisms. But the simple fact is, God wasn't absolutely necessary in a Darwinian universe. Supernatural intervention was replaced by natural selection. It was perhaps a more logical world. It was certainly lonelier. TLC's Great Books Festival continues at the Library of Congress. Great Books is sponsored in part by Network MCI, modern communications technology working for your business, by Johnson & Johnson, where the best ideas for babies are born, and by the new BMW 5 Series, now more than ever the ultimate driving machine. This is about the biggest idea in business communication today. About simple being smart, less being more. About how your business can get local and long distance calling. Plus everything from paging to conferencing, global to cellular. The whole menu, soup to nuts. From one team, on one bill. From the one and only company in America with the power to put it all together. Network MCI. That's how. Recently in Florida, a select group of babies took part in an important study. They helped the Touch Research Institute study the benefits of infant massage. With a small amount of Johnson's baby oil and a simple technique, many babies seemed to sleep better, appeared to cry less often, even seemed more alert. And what the mothers learned was all it takes is a few drops of pure Johnson's baby oil and their own two hands. Johnson's, where the best ideas for babies are born. Why float through life when you can drive? Welcome to a world where reason, science, and the future are up for grabs. The Quest, Fridays premiering October 4th at 8 on TLC. A friend of mine told me, try America Online. I said, why? I've got a computer. He said, try it. You'll see. It's simple. Every time you sign on, welcome. It tells you if you've got mail. You've got mail. Want to send some email? Type the message. Click here, and it's done. I like this. With one click, I can browse all kinds of great features on America Online. I've gotten help with my golf swing, planned my next vacation. I even get stock price updates every 15 minutes. America Online has over 100 newspapers and magazines, everything from Business Week Online to Cycle World, and I can browse them all. With America Online, you can point and click your way across the Internet. 
and their web browser makes it easy to explore the World Wide Web. Call the toll-free number and you'll receive your free startup kit and 15 free hours to look around. It's worth a try. You'll see. Call 1-800-570-9944 now for your free America Online startup kit. That's 1-800-570-9944. Call now to arrange for a free phone consultation. It was a world in transition. The Industrial Revolution was just beginning. In Britain, it seemed, all the world was opening to these engines of change. It was a time of big ideas and big men. There was Erasmus Darwin, a prosperous country physician, a published poet, a free thinker, and a champion of the new technology. His son, Robert, another man of influence and girth, followed him into medicine, and when Robert's second son was born, February 12th, 1809, it was assumed he would be part of a third generation of country physicians. But Charles Robert Darwin was happier in the woods than the classroom. He preferred to be outdoors, hunting, bird watching, collecting, exploring. Charles was in and out of uh, country houses and barnyards, uh, and he saw how people selected the best cattle and the best pigs and the best ho horses and bred from them uh, to improve the quality of the stock. Later on, Charles would call this artificial selection. Uh, his own mother kept fancy pigeons, so Charles could see right at home that from a common rock pigeon, the kind you find in Trafalgar Square in England, you get all kinds of extraordinary breeds, Jacobins and pouters and nuns and like. He abandoned his medical studies and wound up at Cambridge University, where he was to study for the ministry. And that's when it first uh, occurred to him that he could make his name in natural science. He could make better beetle collections than any of the beetle collectors. He came here to the River Cam and scouted along the banks and looked at the trees and pulled beetles out of the bark. Uh, he bested the lot of them. Knowing full well that he was more interested in collecting bugs than saving souls, two of his professors recommended him for a voyage around the world. The refitted 90-foot warship named Beagle was to map the South American coast. It was the turning point in Darwin's life. Intended to last two years, it was five years before the Beagle returned. Five years of collecting, observing, exploring, and writing. The most important stop for Darwin was the Galapagos Islands. This relatively young, isolated archipelago 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador was a naturalist dream, a laboratory of evolution. In a feverishly busy five weeks, he followed seagoing iguanas and tracked tortoises that seemed to vary from island to island. He collected 13 different types of birds that all turned out to be finches and three species of mockingbirds. The animals must have come to the islands from South America in the distant past, but these creatures varied remarkably from their mainland ancestors. Darwin was amazing. He was 27 years old when he got off the Beagle. Uh, his notebooks were, were, were bulging with data about uh, all the places he had visited. Uh, he had enormous collections. In addition to adding to his beetle collection, he gathered 1,500 species preserved in alcohol, 4,000 skins, bones, and dried specimens, crates and crates of fossils, he returned with 3,000 pages of notes on entomology, geology, paleontology, and zoology. He was the toast of London's scientific community. Even his father was finally impressed. Darwin married two years after his return, laying out his options as he might a tray full of bugs. On a scrap of paper, he listed the arguments for and against marriage. In the pro column were children, someone to take care of the house, and companionship. It would be better than a dog, anyhow. On the con side of the ledger, he listed the lack of freedom, quarreling, loss of time, and less money for books. Marriage won out, in spite of the consequences. He married his first cousin, Emma Wedgwood, because, he wrote, she was an angel and had money. They moved to a small estate 20 miles south of London and lived at Down House for the rest of their lives. 
Eventually, they had 10 children, but only seven survived to adulthood. Each day, Darwin would walk the paths of his estate, trying to make sense of the things he saw on the voyage of the Beagle. He wrote for three hours every day, even though he was ill for much of his adult life. Apparently, from the strain of the idea, he was secretly developing. He began a series of pocket notebooks in which he speculated about evolution, transmutation, as it was called in that day. So he pointed to the enormous power of selective breeding of cattle and plants and pigeons that humans have exerted and bred things like Pekingese dogs and pouter pigeons and cabbages that we eat, cauliflowers and so on, all starting from very different ancestors. Our English racehorses differ from horses of every other breed, but they do not owe their difference and superiority to descent from any single pair, but to continued care in selecting and training of many individuals during each generation. 300 years ago, this breed did not exist. English breeders crossed smaller Arabian sires with English mares. Then and now, the thoroughbred is the fastest horse in the world. What Darwin called artificial selection continues at Newmarket, the center of England's horse racing world. People want speed, they want early maturity and they want speed um, because it is so expensive to keep a racehorse in training. We might feel we can produce a lovely mile and a half horse by doing a different mating. If we think we can produce a mile horse with a more commercial mating, then we will go down the latter path because we have to make, you know, make it pay. Economics, aesthetics, love of sport. Such are the pressures that drive the evolution of species in the barnyard. But what then was the force behind natural selection? What was happening in the real world of cabbages and kingfishers? Well, he really made two quite independent claims. One was the belief that all existing organisms, animals, plants, the lot, are all descended from some one or a few very, very simple organisms by just a natural process of descent, the ordinary process of biological reproduction. That's, if you like, the fact of evolution. And then the second thing, he said, was a, a mechanism, a process which would bring it about, which was his idea of natural selection. The survivors were naturally selected in the way that individuals in the barnyard were selected for what the breeder wanted in his stock. And Darwin went on to develop that original idea uh, for 20 years after October 1838, when it occurred to him, and finally it became the centerpiece of his book, The Origin of Species. You're watching the Great Books Festival on TLC. See with perfect clarity, perfect comfort, the way you were meant to see through AccuView contact lenses, precision crafted for exceptional vision, ultra thin for lasting comfort. That's why it's the world's number one contact lens. It's the perfect balance. 2020 vision, 2020 comfort. AccuView disposable contact lenses. And now buy four multi-packs of AccuView from your eye doctor and get this Johnson & Johnson first aid kit free. This is about the biggest idea in business communication today. About simple being smart, less being more. About how your business can get local and long distance calling. Plus everything from paging to conferencing, global to cellular. The whole menu, soup to nuts. From one team, on one bill. From the one and only company in America with the power to put it all together. Network MCI. That's how. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Dinner time. Is my little precious hungry? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing has more lives than a DuPont Stain Master carpet. <laughs> so for beauty that lasts, insist on the quality of Stain Master. Come on, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I tell you. I was framed. Backed and warranted by DuPont. Mother.
Today, more than ever, business isn't conducted in just one language, nor does it rely on a single currency or a universal set of rules. So what makes you think it operates at just one speed? That's why worldwide, UPS gives you more guaranteed on-time delivery choices than anyone else. After all, business today may know no boundaries, but when it comes to deadlines, it has plenty. UPS, moving at the speed of business. Got any Tylenol, Jill? Oh, when did you switch to Tylenol? When my doctor told me some pain relievers could irritate my stomach. Really? Pain relievers? Yeah, my doctor said the aspirin and even ibuprofen can sometimes irritate your stomach. Oh, no kidding. Mm -hmm. But Tylenol doesn't, and it works great. To avoid the chance of stomach irritation, Tylenol is the pain reliever recommended most by doctors. How's your stomach? Stuffed. Oh. Tylenol, the pain reliever hospitals use most. This fall on TLC. You know where you are? New Adventures. World Premiere Productions. New Series. This fall, see it all only on TLC. Adventures for your mind. Nursed by warm sunbeams and primeval caves, organic life began beneath the waves. Hence, without parent, by spontaneous birth, rise the first specks of animated earth. That ode to evolution was written by old Erasmus Darwin a decade or so before Charles was born. The idea that creatures evolved had first come from the ancient Greeks, but it was explored systematically for the first time in the early 1800s. The French naturalist Jean-Baptiste Pierre-Antoine de Monet, Chevalier de Lamarck, published a paper proposing that all life forms originated from a single, simple organism. He claimed the variety of life was the result of species responding to their environment. To explain how this happened, Lamarck suggested characteristics acquired by a parent, highly developed muscles, for example, could be passed on to descendants. The only thing wrong with his theory was that it was wrong. We know now that genes control what traits are passed from parent to offspring, not what the parent did during his lifetime. Darwin wore his walking path smooth, trying to understand the how of evolution. There were three elements in his theory. First, in the random shuffle of heredity, each individual is born slightly different from all others. All mammals, most animals, most plants, and indeed even many bacteria, have sexual processes whereby genes from two different parental lineages come together in a single descendant. So it's the uniting of, of, of inventions made in different lineages into a single descendant that seems to be the great thing that sex does for you. The second element is the cruelty of nature. Far more individuals are born than the world has room for. There is a struggle for survival. Some of those inherited differences coupled with an occasional random mutation will give an organism an advantage in the fight to stay alive. If brighter plumage is more attractive to the opposite sex, the fancier bird will have more chicks, who will in turn have fancy feathers. So the cruelty of nature fills the role of the horse breeder or the farmer. Nature carefully selects those life forms best adapted to the environment to live and to reproduce. It's absolutely vital to understand that Darwinism is a non-random process. Mutation is a random process. Mutation is the random change in genes which offers up in each generation the raw material for natural selection. But it's natural selection that actually makes life the way it is and gives it its quality of looking as though it's been designed. By 1842, Darwin's theory of natural selection was essentially complete. He wrote a brief outline and two years later expanded it into a 230-page essay 
to be published only in the event of his death. He had seen how the powerful Anglican establishment could hound, humiliate, and even jail those who denied God. Darwin was too cautious to publish, but too ambitious and proud to have his idea die with him. For 15 years, he collected and collated data supporting natural selection in his study at Down House. He wrote scientific papers and books, but kept his more speculative work a secret. After that, he was persuaded by his friend Lyell to sit down now and start working up uh, this book on species that he had been planning so long. What a shock it must have been when he opened the mail one day in 1858. Alfred Russell Wallace, a young naturalist collecting specimens in Malaysia, sent him a paper asking him to review an idea he had come up with. When Darwin read this essay, he was thunderstruck because it was his own theory of natural selection, as he himself said. Darwin quickly wrote a summary of his work and sent both papers off to be read to the scientists and naturalists at the prestigious Linnaean Society. Now Darwin started to condense his huge manuscript, condense it into what he called informally an abstract, and that became the famous book on the origin of species. Now that Darwin was going public, his fears of censure and damnation haunted him for the next 18 months as he tried to get the most important work of his life ready for publication. Well, those 18 months were murder for Darwin. Darwin was still afraid of persecution. After months and months of struggling, Darwin finally finished the last proof. He went all the way up to the farthest verge of civilization on the North Yorkshire Moors, and there Darwin was miserable. He didn't have his wife and his kids with him to begin with. Um, he tripped, and his ankles swelled up huge so he could hardly walk. Uh, he had a fiery rash on his face. He developed boils. Uh, he said it was like living in hell. And what was he doing when he was there? He was writing letters to accompany pre-publication copies of The Origin of Species, to go out to all of the naturalists, the geologists, the old Anglican clergymen, whose respect he had cultivated for so many years. And his letters were peppered with phrases like, you will not approve of your old student. You will abhor what I've written. You will fulminate anathemas. You will long to crucify me alive. The first printing was sold out the day of publication. Darwin was startled to hear that copies were being snapped up by commuters at Waterloo train station. The press saw through Darwin's attempt to downplay the evolution of man, and his long white beard quickly became an icon in magazines. From religious conservatives came the expected charges that the book was atheistic nonsense. From the scientific community came high praise, and occasionally the equivalent of, why didn't I think of that? On June 30th, 1860, the controversy came to a head at a debate before the British Association for the Advancement of Science. Bishop Samuel Wilberforce attacked the Darwinian view. Biologist T.H. Huxley supported natural selection. Before 700 people crammed into a stuffy library, the bishop asked Huxley whether he was descended from a monkey on his grandfather's side or his grandmother's. Huxley whispered to a companion, the Lord has delivered him into my hands, and then stood and told the assembly that he would rather have an ape for a grandfather than a man who introduced ridicule into a scientific meeting. There's no other 19th century work of biology to which uh, contemporary biologists, scientists working today, would go back in order to see whether they could learn something new. In the history of biology, it's difficult to conceive of a greater book than The Origin of Species. It fundamentally, and I believe permanently, changed our view of nature. We live in a world of Darwinian principles. We need a new flu vaccine every year. Pesticide-resistant bugs are devastating crops. Cholera, malaria, and tuberculosis are coming back. The AIDS virus changes so rapidly, drugs stop working. 
We have encouraged the evolution of resistance to the very antibiotics we want to use. It's extremely irresponsible, careless, and stupid of us. And if, well, it, let's put it that if all doctors learnt some evolution theory when they were in college, it might have saved a great many deaths. You have gotten tuberculosis to come back into the great cities of the United States, for example. We have, at any one time, about 20-some patients in this hospital with tuberculosis. If your eyesight is good and you know where to look, you can watch Darwin's principles in action. Bugs, particularly the bugs that we have in our intestine, they divide every 30 minutes. Bugs are very promiscuous. We may be in a promiscuous era for, for adults but, and for children, but let me tell you, bugs have been promiscuous from time immemorial. A enterococcus doesn't feel that it makes any difference whether it mates with a group A strep or with a pneumococcus or with a staph or some other organism like that. It is totally impervious. It has no character whatsoever. In Dr. New's lab at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, dishes filled with a bacteria-infested culture are used to study how organisms change. Once the bacteria are well-established and breeding away, dots of antibiotics are introduced. The circle around each dot is a dead zone. The bigger the circle, the more bacteria have been killed, the more effective the drug. But of the many millions of individual bacteria in the colony, a tiny fraction will be naturally resistant to the drug. When their rivals die, the survivors quickly take over. Virtually all staphylococci in the world in 1941 were susceptible to penicillin. By 1944, although very little penicillin had been used in a hospital, what had happened is 25% have become resistant. By 47, when one started to use penicillin extensively in hospitals to treat pneumococcal pneumonia, to treat severe infections, what had happened, we were up to 75% resistance. Those organisms now would not be killed by penicillin. So discoveries that were hailed only a few years ago as miracle drugs have not been the permanent panaceas we thought they'd be. It's Darwinian theory at its best. And this organism can only be killed by a couple antibiotics. And I will tell you that if I use this one that's inhibiting it at the present time, in a week it will be resistant to that, it will be resistant to that, and resistant to that in a week. In a week. That's why diseases we thought we had conquered, like malaria and tuberculosis, are coming back, leapfrogging over our efforts to stay ahead of them. It does turn out, again, that many bacteria become resistant to penicillin, and we can follow the changes. In the case of um, malaria, which is also becoming a very ser serious uh, disease again, it's partly that the malarial parasite has changed. It's also, of course, that malaria is, is transmitted by, um, by mosquitoes, and the mosquitoes have changed. I mean, we used to be able to kill the mosquitoes with insecticide, and now we can't. So it's both the mosquito and, and the malaria are changing. We're, we're creating trouble for ourselves. What we are seeing in the microscope and in the headlines is natural selection at work. No, it is a continuous little race going on between predators and their prey, diseases and their hosts and so on. Constantly happening. Unlike bacteria and viruses, which can mutate and adapt with astonishing speed, man cannot. Humans change so slowly that over 95% of our genetic makeup dates back to the Stone Age. That impacts on our emotions and our reactions to stress. A new field called Darwinian medicine is an attempt to understand how traits we have picked up through hundreds of thousands of years of evolution are at work today. We may be doing things which sometimes are so different from the way uh, things were when we evolved that we set up some tensions. A classic example that's often used would be um, we are equipped to respond to emergency situations with what uh, Walter Cannon called the fight or flight response, which, you know, adrenaline pumping round, blood sugar raised, and so on. 
There used to be a point to it all. Adrenaline speeds up reaction time. Increased blood sugar gives us instant energy. Blood is diverted to the muscles, and we're ready to fight nature's marauders. And all we're facing is another parking ticket. There are some less obvious examples of evolved defenses that are more important medically. For example, some infectious bacteria need iron to grow. People with chronic disease sometimes are found to have low iron levels. And some physicians who don't know about this defense are liable to give those patients iron. When in fact, the body has a very complex evolved mechanism for taking a lot of the iron that's free in the circulation and quickly storing it in the liver so it's not available to bacteria. Certainly our knowledge can't affect our genetics in, in any direct way. Um, but our knowledge about how these mechanisms work can be very useful to us. More controversial are attempts to apply Darwinian laws to human behavior. Some of our, perhaps, behavioral responses uh, that are highly aggressive under certain circumstances may be behavioral responses that we share with chimpanzees and gorillas. Some scientists contend an evolutionary understanding may go a long way toward explaining the advantages of certain behaviors we see in the world today. The field is called sociobiology. Males of many species exhibit aggressiveness, competitiveness, jealousy, and the skills that help their ancestors survive. That might explain the warlike behavior of members of the human species. If we like someone's bright eyes, glossy hair, white teeth, it's because we're programmed to look for a healthy partner. Our actions say, I'm quick and healthy, sexually mature, and my genes deserve to be passed along. Is this a holdover from the dawn of man? Are we all driven by biological imperatives? Highly unlikely, say the many critics of Darwinian psychology. The part played in our lives by inherited behavior is minuscule compared with the effects of real life experience. And they say the idea that our behavior is pre-programmed plays into the hands of those who say that the inequalities of our society are inevitable. The debate goes on. Still, 150 years later, Darwin continues to be a key in telling us about ourselves and our history. This is about the biggest idea in business communication today. About simple being smart, less being more. About how your business can get local and long distance calling. Plus everything from paging to conferencing, global to cellular. The whole menu, soup to nuts. From one team, on one bill. From the one and only company in America with the power to put it all together. Network MCI. That's how. Front desk. Mrs. Landis, room 411, of course. Did you enjoy our luau tonight? Oh, I see. Well, I'm going to send up something I think you'll like much better than Tom's. Pepsi AC, hmm? Just take one now. It'll control acid all night long so you can sleep. And Mrs. Landis, you can take a Pepsi AC before you eat. Good night. Oh, that luau. Oh. You can be heartburn free with Pepsi AC. As president, I would reduce the deficit by cutting spending in all facets of government. Hey, if the government wants to save money, they should take a lesson from small business and go to Office Max. Office supplies, computers, electronics, software, furniture. Great stuff like Rand McNally Atlases and Broder Bun software at guaranteed low prices. So any business can save time and money, even the government. You know, maybe America needs a candidate who actually knows how to save money. How about you? Office Max, we go to the max for you.
frontiers completes your understanding. Without it, would you know how TV works? Or what gives sex its appeal? And that's just for starters. Understanding, all week beginning Monday at 10 on TLC. You know, we've been taught a lot of history that's just plain wrong, but we'll set the record straight on Myth America, Tuesdays premiering October 1st on TLC. Adventures for your mind. The Quest, Fridays premiering October 4th at 8 on TLC. Life's full of compromises. You give up high performance for high capacity. You pass on your favorite foods to fit into your favorite jeans. And with credit cards, find one with a low interest rate and, well... We're sorry, the bank is now closed. But now there's a credit card with no compromises. The low-rate Optima card from American Express. Now you can carry a balance at a low rate and get American Express service. Apply now. There's no annual fee. Call 1-800-4-OPTIMA. You'll get a low rate of 7.9% for an entire year, so you can pay off your bill at your own pace. And after that, the rate won't skyrocket like with some other cards. Plus, there's no annual fee, ever. You can apply now, right over the phone. And you'll have the service of American Express. No problem. It's all taken care of. Call now, 1-800-4-OPTIMA. Get the savings and the service with no compromises and no annual fee. The Optima card from American Express. It gives you more to let you do more. Dancing across the screen are triplets of letters. The language of life. Those T's and G's and A's and C's spell out genes. The basic building blocks of heredity. Scientists are using this newest of the sciences to answer some of the oldest questions. And the gleaming glassware and the glowing computer screens are confirming a lot of what Darwin suspected all alone. The split between humans and chimpanzees, we think from the molecular biology, was around five to seven million years ago, which is very recent on an evolutionary time scale. And humans and chimpanzees are so closely related, for instance, that if you examine the proteins that are the same from the same gene, you often cannot find any differences in the subunits of those proteins. Rebecca Kahn was on the team at the University of California at Berkeley that found clues to our past, deep in our cells. They studied the genetic code from people all over the world. What we're really looking at is, is a process called lineage coalescence. When you did that, they all coalesced into a single ancestor, a maternal ancestor. They calculated human lineage back some 200,000 years to a theoretical ancestor the press promptly dubbed Eve. I actually don't like to use the word Eve because it has a lot of religious connotations that aren't really biologically accurate. It implies that there was a single ancestor for all people, and this is sometimes seen in the press as a single woman who gave rise to all humans. That's not really true. There could have been anywhere from 2,000 to 10,000. If the Berkeley team's research holds, then everyone in the world, all the individuals and families and tribes and races, can trace their family tree back to a small band of people who lived in Africa 200,000 years ago. If anything had happened to that tiny group, famine, flood, disease, anything, the human race might not exist. There has to have been several billion years of continuous successful parent to offspring transmission to get to us at any one point if that had not been successful our line of ancestry would have died in the northern hemisphere horses evolved to fill a herbivore's niche in the ecosystem on the isolated continent of australia nature took a different tack instead of horses evolution came up with kangaroos if we ran evolution again I'd be pretty confident that you would get animals that we'd call carnivores, animals that we call herbivores, animals that we'd call parasites, and so on. And they would do their carnivory, their herbivory, and their, and their parasitism in roughly the same ways, but they wouldn't be exactly the same. It might not even finish up with an intelligent, communicating, talking animal. I mean, it's very striking that the dinosaurs ruled the Earth for 100 million years, they ran about on their hind legs, so their hands were freed. There's nothing to stop them making tools. And yet they never invented or evolved an intelligent speaking form. Try to imagine what the Earth's dominant species would have looked like if dinosaurs had evolved instead of mammals. 
paleobiologist Dale Russell of the Canadian Museum of Nature did that. And the result was a winsome green creature who probably would have been sure that it too was the inevitable outcome of biological history. <laughs> if it shot on Kodak film and printed on Kodak paper, <laughs> we'll replace it for free. Introducing the Kodak Picture Guarantee. This is about the biggest idea in business communication today. About simple being smart, less being more. About how your business can get local and long distance calling. Plus everything from paging to conferencing, global to cellular. The whole menu, soup to nuts. From one team on one bill. From the one and only company in America with the power to put it all together. Network MCI. That's how. See with perfect clarity, perfect comfort. The way you were meant to see through AccuView contact lenses. Precision crafted for exceptional vision. Ultra thin for lasting comfort. That's why it's the world's number one contact lens. It's the perfect balance. 2020 vision, 2020 comfort. AccuView disposable contact lenses. And now buy four multi-packs of AccuView from your eye doctor and get this Johnson & Johnson first aid kit free. Come on, you know I love you. Of course I've got your picture. It's in my jean jacket, right next to my heart. If it's shot on Kodak film and printed on Kodak paper, we'll replace it for free. Introducing the Kodak Picture Guarantee. Frankenstein, a plea for tolerance or a warning about the dark side of science. The War of the Worlds, popular science fiction or an argument for genetic engineering. Go beyond the pages of classic literature for the answers when you order the Great Books Video Collection. Gain perspective on the author's lives. Grapple with universal themes. Narrated by Donald Sutherland and featuring insights by famous artists, authors, and scholars, these entertaining videos will rekindle your interest in the most compelling tales of our times. Call 1-800-203-6262 for your Great Books Video Collection. You get all 10 videos with display case, plus this free hardcover book of Frankenstein. Stein, all for just four easy payments of $24.95 plus shipping and handling. Satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Moby Dick, clash of good and evil or a cry to save the whales. Call 1-800-203-6262 to order your videos now. Karl Marx, Andrew Carnegie, Joseph Stalin, John D. Rockefeller, Adolf Hitler, what do these men have in common? From capitalists to communists, all found in a misinterpretation of Darwin, justification for the conduct of their lives. They seized on a phrase Darwin never used, survival of the fittest, and used it to rationalize attitudes and actions that affected the course of modern history. In the late 19th century, there was a whole school of thought, or perhaps several schools of thought, which now are known as social Darwinism which really used evolution as an underwriting of a fairly crude kind of competitive ethic in society. Um, what we might call a free market ethic, but more than that, the notion of dog eat dog, the weakest to the wall. And the phrase that Darwin's contemporary Herbert Spencer actually used for natural selection, which was survival of the fittest. But Spencer thought evolution had a direction, from simple to complex, from inferior to superior. Darwin's version of the theory was not survival of the fittest. It could be better paraphrased as survival of those best adapted. Well, the master race idea from which we think of in connection with the 30s and with Germany, in some senses, was the low point in the whole attempt to apply evolutionary uh, and biological thinking to human affairs because that's to turn a scientific theory into a moral statement or even a political statement, which of course it is not. The Nazis taught that Jews were evolutionary throwbacks. The Aryan race, they said, was the pinnacle of evolution and maintaining racial purity was an evolutionary obligation. But it wasn't just Hitler. Uh, who thought about the idea of applying biological ideas uh, in a rather radical way to uh, human affairs. Eugenics 
uh, as an idea, the idea that we should somehow apply uh, principles to make us evolve into a superior species. Those ideas had been commonplace in the United States, in North America, and across Europe for 25 years before Hitler came to power. In Darwin's time, too, there were those, most typically among the gentry, who claimed that evolution justified their lives. They said money given to the poor was merely aiding the unfit, allowing them to increase their numbers and delay evolutionary progress. The argument is not unknown today. Darwin was clearly uncomfortable using words like evolve and evolution because the words contained the notion of going from a lesser state to something better. As Darwin defined natural selection, it had no particular direction. Descent with modification doesn't have a goal. It just is. We have no automatic right to our place on the Earth. We have no automatic uh, guarantee of our long-term survival. Uh, most species that have ever lived are now extinct. Um, evolution is about change. And we suddenly realize how fragile any given or single species life is, including our own. Uh, and I think that general moral, that there is something about our place within the living world and our responsibility as a moral and an intelligent species, perhaps to try to conserve, to, to nourish that uh, living world and not simply to do with it what we will for short-term gain, that may be, in the long run, perhaps the single most significant moral insight that we get from the idea of evolution. Such insights are a direct result of the studies of a reclusive beetle collector with a passion for facts. We will need such moral insights if we eventually use the genetic tools that modern science is developing. And I'm pretty sure that if we survive, if we do not destroy ourselves by pollution and atomic war and so on, we will sooner or later wish to take control of our own evolution. But I hope we do not do it too soon. I mean, I think at the moment we are far too ignorant, both of genetics and of what we really want to tinker with our own evolution. Um, so I'm not, in, I'm not urging eugenic measures upon us. I'm really not. I hope we will not do that. But ultimately, I'm sure we will. What we shall decide we want, of course, is up to our great-great-great-grandchildren. But they, they will take this on. Charles Darwin lived in Down House until he died in 1882. He continued walking, thinking, writing papers and books. He finally tackled the touchy subject of human evolution in a book called The Descent of Man. But none of his later works would match the impact of Origin of Species. In a very real sense, that book gave us the world. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed by the Creator into a few forms or into one. From so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved.
Is this something you'd like to have? You know, a trim, sexy waistline you'll be proud to show off? Or how...